Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT official guide 2022. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Always make sure that this book is in front of you when you're working with me. Today we'll solve some problems that you will find on page number 139 and 140. The very first problem that we see there on page 139 is number 172. In 172 we are told that the total cost to manufacture something, total cost is made up of the fixed cost plus the variable cost. We are further told that the fixed cost happens to be exactly $10,000. The variable cost we are told is three dollars per unit. Three dollars per unit. We are further told that we're going to sell this unit, whatever it is that we're making, we're going to sell it for eight dollars per unit, and we're going to sell twenty thousand units. The question simply is, what is the profit per unit? What is the profit per unit? Let's find out, shall we? In order for us to figure out the profit per unit, before we can worry about finding out profit per unit, we have to first know the total cost of making it, the 20,000 units, making them rather, the 20,000 units, and the total revenue that we generate from selling those 20,000 units. The total cost is right here. We have a fixed cost of $10,000 and a variable cost of $3 per unit. We are selling 20,000 units. There we go. So we have $60,000 of variable cost, $10,000 of fixed cost, a grand total of $70,000. What, what, what is going to be our revenue when we sell these units? Well, we're getting $8 per unit and we're going to sell 20,000 of them. If we're going to sell 20,000 of them for $8 per unit, we're going to get $160,000. So that was quite straightforward. The revenue is $160,000, the total cost is $70,000, hence giving us a profit of $90,000. Hence, giving us a profit of $90,000. But that's the total profit. We want the profit per unit. So we are selling 20,000 units. There we go. Thousands drop out, zero goes away. Nine divided by two is four and a half. It looks like our profit is going to be, it looks like our profit is going to be $4.50 per unit. Next one, 173. In 173, we are told that Q is an odd number. We are told that the median of Q consecutive integer is 120. The question is, What's the largest integer in this scenario, expressed in terms of Q, of course. Let's see what we can do. The easiest, the simplest, the quickest way to deal with this thing is to just make up some number for Q. How many odd integers do you want? We can have as few as 3 or we can have 5. Let's just have 7 just to make it more interesting. So let's make Q equal to 7. So if you have 7 odd integers, uh, uh, if you have 7 consecutive integers, we are told that the median is 120. Let's make up seven numbers. One, two, three, and then the middle one, and one, two, three. And this is 120, we're told, this is the median. As you can clearly see, if this is the middle one, then the largest one that we're going to have is simply going to be 120 plus, plus three. Why 120 plus three? Because this is 120, 121, 122, 123, plus three. This quantity has to represent three. Where is the 3 going to come from? That's going to come from the fact that Q, which is our 7, we're going to take away 1 from it, hence giving us 6. After we put the median here, we have 6 integers left. 3 on this side, 3 on this side. So it's Q minus 1, half of that. This is 6. This quantity represents 6. Half of half on this side and half on this side. The smallest one is going to be 120 minus Q minus 1 over 1, 2. In other words, 120 minus 3, 120 plus 3. That's all. 174. 174. 
in 174 we have, well, let's just erase this thing so I can actually draw the diagram. We are told that we have a ladder that is leaning against the wall at 60 degree angle. Of course, this of course is 90 and therefore this must be 30. We are told that the ladder is 75 feet. The question is, how high is the ladder? How high is the highest point of the ladder? This is 174. And we are told the ladder is sitting 7 feet off the ground. Which is not a big deal. All we have to do is add 7 more feet to whatever we get there for this side here and just add 7 more feet. As you can see it's a 30-60-90 triangle. In a 30-60-90 triangle the sides are in the ratio of 1 which is the, the side that is smallest which faces the smallest angle which happens to be 1. They are this is how I remember it. This is how I remember it. I write down 1, 2, and 3, and you put a square root sign on the last one. This is the smallest one. This is the largest one. That's 2. So that's this side, which is 2 times 35, because this is, it should be 70, not 75. And then square root of 3 is going to come here. And it's just 30. It's, it's a 1, 2, square root of 3, multiplied by 35. This is The smallest side is going to be 35. But we're not interested in how far the ladder is on the ground from the wall. We are interested in how high is the ladder from the ground. The answer is this quantity plus 7. Plus 7 because 7 feet off the ground. 175. Again, let's just erase this thing so I don't have to deal with it. I need the room. In 175, We have a window that looks something like this. We are told that the top part is semicircular. We are told that this is semicircular. We are further told that the, from the highest point of the window to here, the lowest point is 10 feet. It's 10 feet tall. And we are told that this is 4 feet. So the question simply is, what's the area of this, what's the area of this window? Well, if this is 10 feet, then this must be 8 feet from here, from here to here. Because the, because the diameter is 4 feet, which means the radius is 2 feet, which means from here to here is also 2 feet. I'm explaining too much here. So that's 8 feet. So that's just very simple. It's just 8 by 4. This part just is 8 by 4. We just have to figure out the area of the circle and take half of it. Area of the circle which has a diameter of 2 feet. That's what it is. So it's pi r squared, which is simply pi r squared. And that represents the area of the entire circle. We want half of it. That part plus 32 and that represents the area of the window that's all that was number 175 that was 175 let's move on 176 let's see what it has to say One hundred and seventy-six. we are told that we have a quantity that looks something like this t raised to or rather t over 1000 and the whole thing is raised to 4 whole thing is raised to 4 and we are told that this quantity when you expand it when you expand it it turns out that it has it has fewer fewer than 8 zeros between a decimal point and the first non-zero it has fewer than 8 fewer than eight zeros between the decimal point and the first non-zero digit that we find when we expand this quantity. The question is, what can be the value of t? Can it be number one? Can it be, can it be three? Can, can t be three? Let's find out. Three over 1,000 raised to four is what we're dealing with. 1,000, as you can see, what this 1,000 that we have can very easily be written as 10 raised to 3. 10 raised to 3 raised to 4 is going to give us 10 raised to 12. 
and on the top you have 3 raised to 4, but 3 raised to 4 is just 3 squared times 3 squared, which is just 81, so it's 81 over 10 raised to 12. Now the question simply is, does, does this quantity, when, when it's written out in a decimal form, does it have fewer than 8 zeros before we hit the first non-zero digit? Let's find out. So it's 81, right here, 81. The, digit, the decimal is right here right now. And since it's 10 raised to 12, since we're dividing by 10 raised to 12, we have to move this decimal place 12 places. So here we have 3, 6, 9, and 12. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and here is our decimal. This is what it looks like when we move this decimal place ends up here. As you can clearly see, we have 3, 6, 9, and 10 zeros. We have 10 zeros before we hit the first non-zero, first non-zero digit. First non-zero digit is 8, but in order to get to 8, we have to get through 10 zeros. It is supposed to have fewer than 8. Obviously, it cannot be 3. It has to be something bigger than 3. Let's look at the next one. Can it be... Can it be 5? Well, if it were 5, we'll end up here with 5 raised to 4, which is same as 5 squared times 5 squared. 5 squared times 5 squared. It's just 25 times 25, which is 625. As you can clearly see, we're going to have the same problem. 625, when we move the decimal place from here, we're going to move three places, and we're going to have to go nine more zeros. It's not going to work. 625, decimal place is here, so we move three places, three more, three more, and three more, because we have to move 12 places. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 and decimal is right here this decimal ends up here. It has nine zeros. It has three, six, nine zeros. It's supposed to have fewer than eight. Can it be nine? We need something bigger, obviously. Can it be nine? Nine raised to four, which is going to be the same as nine squared times nine squared, which is same as 81 times 81, 81 times 81, and perhaps we're getting some place now. 81 times 81, 1 times 81 is just 81, 8 times 1 is 8, 8, eight, is, a six, eight, eight, eight is a 64, there we go. We have 1, we have 16, we have 5, and a 6, there we go. And now, let's write it here, 6561 has a decimal place that is sitting here. We have to move this thing 12 places, so let's do that. Here are the 3 places. Three more places, three more places, and three more places. So that's three places, that's three more, and then three more, and then three more. And now the decimal ends up here. This decimal place ends up here, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There you go. Voila. Eight zeros. We have eight zeros before we hit the first non zero digits. Nine works. Answer is three. Nine works. Or does it? It does not. Nine also does nine also does not work because when we do this nine nine over ten thousand raised to four, we end up with a quantity that has exactly eight zeros. It has exactly eight zeros. The bloody thing is supposed to have fewer than eight zeros. Fewer than eight zero means it better have seven or six or five. It cannot have eight zeros. It has to be fewer than eight. Nine also does not work. The answer here is. The answer here is none. All the three choices that are given to us, 3, 5, and 9, none of them produce a quantity such that we go through fewer than 8 zeros before we hit the first non-zero digit. Number 177. In number 177, we have a three-digit code on a lock. A three-digit code on a lock, and it has to meet three conditions. The first condition, second condition, the third condition. 
because there are three digits, and each digit has certain conditions that we have to fulfill. First condition is that the, that the first digit cannot, cannot be 0 or 1. It cannot be 0 or 1. Second digit, we are told, must be, must be either a 0 or a 1. And the third digit we are told has to meet one condition as well. And we are told the third condition, third digit should be just such that it should be such that the second and third digits cannot be both zeros. The question is, given these three conditions for the three digits, how many different possible ways are there that we can create the code? Let's find out, shall we? How many different possible codes are how many, how many different codes are possible for this three-digit uh, lock? Let's find out, shall we? In a situation like this, when you have several conditions, it's always a good idea to start with the simplest condition first. The simplest condition here is the fact that this, this guy has to be either 0 or a 1. So let's start with here. We're going to look at two scenarios. In one scenario, we're going to make the second digit equal to 0. In the second scenario, we're going to make second digit equal to 1. And let's begin. So here are three digits, one, two, and three. The first digit cannot be zero or one. If it cannot be zero or zero or one, there are ten digits, zero through nine, we have ten digits. It cannot be zero and it cannot be one. There are only eight possibilities. It can be two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. That's it. There are eight possibilities. Second digit is pretty fixed. It's not pretty fixed, it is fixed because it's zero. There's only one way we can fill it. It's either going to be zero or it's going to be one. The last digit we are told, we have, so it has to be such that the second and third digit cannot be both zeros. Well, the second digit is not zero. Since the second digit is not zero, it's okay for this digit to be for, it's okay for this digit to be zero. So it can be anything from zero to nine. We have ten possibilities. Now we go to this part. So it's either this, it's either this, or this. I don't know what's wrong with my handwriting. Again, the first digit could be anything as long as it is not 0 or 1, so there are 8 possibilities. There is only one way we can fill out the second space because it's equal to 1. Because second space has to be 1. Here we have 10 possibilities, but because... Oh, sorry, we had a 1 here. We made the second digit to be equal to 1 here. We better make the second digit to be... Ah, oh, second digit is equal to 0 here, so now the second digit is equal to 1 here. How many codes are possible? This must be 0 or 1. Cannot be both 0. Oh, this, this thing is wrong here. If the second digit is 0 here, the second digit is zero. The one here represents not the actual code, but how many possibilities are there. There's only one way we can fit the second spot by putting a zero here. If we put a zero here, we cannot have a zero here because second and third digit cannot be both zero. So if we put a zero here, we cannot have a zero here. We have only nine possibilities here. And here, we are putting one. Second digit is equal to one, so here we have ten possibilities because the third digit can be anything we want, zero through nine. There we go, we are done. It's simply 72 plus 80, 72 plus 80, whatever that happens to be. 72 plus 80 is 152. So 70 plus 80 is 150. 177. I got confused for a second. 178, rather. In 178, we are told that we have a solution. We're going to mix. Two solutions, two solutions. One is weak solution, a two percent solution. Other one is a twelve percent solution. We're going to mix them and produce uh, something that's only going to be five percent concentration. That's going to that's going to have a concentration of only five percent. So we're going to have two solutions here. One is two percent. One is twelve percent. We are told that we have to make sixty liters, such that. such that the 60 liter solution that we make by combining these two solutions 
is only 5% concentration. The question is, how many, how many liters do we need of the weaker one? Well, if we have x liters here, and since we have a total of 60, this must be 60 minus x. As we can clearly see, it's a simple, it's a simple, very straightforward weighted average problem. This is going to have a weight of 2, this is going to have a weight of 12, such that the final, uh, final uh, outcome is 5%. So let's do that. Forget the percentage sign, 2 plus x plus 12 times 60 minus x has to equal this thing right here, 5 times 60. That's all. We just have to solve for x. So let's do that. 12 times 6 is 72, so it's 720 minus 12x. And here, here we have 2x, and it has to equal 300. Bring the 720 to that side. 300 minus 720 is going to give us 420. And here we have positive 2x and a negative 12 is going to give us negative 10x. There we go, we are done. Uh, draw the zeros and x equals 42. x equals 42. 179. In 179 we are told that if Jack loses 8 pounds, his weight is going to be equal to 2 times his sister's. Jack weighs, Jack's weight is such that if he were to lose 8 pounds, he will end up weighing only twice as much as her sister does. And we also told, so that's, that's our first equation. If Jack, if Jack loses 8 pounds, if Jack loses 8 pounds, he'll end up being twice, he'll end up paying twice as much as his sister. We also told that together they weigh, together we are told that they weigh 278. In other words, in other words, J, J plus J plus S equals 278. The question is how much is how much is J? Well, we can what can we do? 278. Let's bring the 2S here, 2S here and bring the 8 over there. So we'll end up with j, j minus 2s would have to equal, bring the 8 on this side and 2s on this side equals 8. There you go. Subtract this equation from that equation. Voila. I just realized that we'll end up cancelling the j. We want, we want to find out j. We'll end up solving for s. It's not a big deal. We'll just figure out the s first and then the j. So 278 minus 8 is just 270. A positive j and a negative j is going to cancel out, obviously. And we'll end up with s plus 2s is 3s. So divide by 3 and we'll end up equal s equals to 90. If s equals 90, that, must, that, implies, the j, that implies the j must equal, since they, weigh, since they weigh together 278, 278 minus 90 is what we're looking for. 278 minus 90 is what we're looking for. 278 minus 100 would have been 178. Since we're subtracting only 90, it's 188. Jack weighs 188 pounds. 180. Number 180, we are on the next page already. I didn't realize it. Page 180, ah, page 1, rather number 180, for the time being I'm going to skip number 180 because 180 could take, uh, depending on how good of a job I do on it, it could end up taking a long time and I don't, I don't want to start this thing right now, I want to continue with the, with the, with the other problems, we'll do number 180 in the next video, the very first problem that we'll do in the next video is 180. 
uh, because then we won't have to stop in the middle of everything for a long time that is let's just continue with the ones that are straightforward 181 181 is a very straightforward Venn diagram problem here's what we're told we're told where can I put it we're told that 26 go to England 26 go to France we are told that 32 go to Italy we are told that zero people go to both England and France that's a France, that's an F we are told that six go to both England and Italy and we are told that 11 go to both France and Italy question is how many travel at least pay attention we are being asked to find out how many people travel at least one country we are not being asked to find out how many travel how many people travel exactly one country they are not asking how many people travel one country they are asking how many people travel at least one country as you can see it's a classic Venn diagram we are going to solve this as a Venn diagram so let's begin uh, if I had put three of these things a little bit higher we would have had more room but since I sold it there I'm not going to raise it so let's begin then, shall we so we have three countries well, we have England we have France and we have Italy. Let's begin. We have 26 people who go to England. We have same number of people who go to France. And we have 32 people who go to Italy. Then we, go, then we are told that zero people, zero people go to both England and France. England and France is right here. Zero people go to both countries. Before we go any further, we have to understand that if zero people, number of people who visited both England and France is zero, this must, that must also imply that the number of people who visited all three countries must also be zero. There cannot be anybody. There cannot be anybody who tra who must who could have traveled all three countries because if you travel all three countries, you obviously must have gone through England and France. But we are told that nobody has gone through gone to England and France. If nobody has gone through these two countries then there must, it must be true that there is nobody who has traveled all three countries. So that makes our life easier because this could have been a very tricky one to deal with. This is zero. Let's continue. Six people went from England and Italy. England and England and Italy. Six people right here. So as long as we put six here, we have to subtract six from here because we, we don't want to end up double counting those six people. And we subtract six from here. 32 minus six would be 32 minus two is 30 plus minus four is, so is 26. Then we are told that 11 people went to both France and Italy. France and Italy, 11 people. So we put 11 here and subtract 11 from here. 26 minus 10 is 16, so it's going to be 15. And since this is 15, this is also 15, because we're dealing with the same number, 26. Let's take a look at it. At least one country. Let's do it right here. So we have 20 people who traveled to England. We have 15 people who traveled to France. We have 15 people who travel to Italy. Now if we stop right here, this represents this number represents the number of people who travel to exactly one country. Now let's let's take a look at how many people travel to two countries. Because we know nobody has traveled to all three countries. We know the number of people who travel England and France is zero. This is England and France. Uh, six people have traveled to England and Italy. And eleven people have traveled to France and Italy. There we go. These are the number of people who have traveled to at least one country. Let's, let's add it up. 5 plus 5 is 10. 6 plus 1 is 7. 7 plus 10 is 17. 7 carry 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Looks like 67 people. 67 people have traveled to at least one country in this travel club. 182. 182.
In 182, we are told that this year, our profit was $385. Last year, we were told, our profit was $320. The question simply is, approximately, by, appro by approximately what percentage did our profit go up? Well, let's find out, shall we? And it's important to pay attention that they're looking for approximate value. Don't waste your time trying to figure out the exact value that will take forever. So, we went from 320 to 385, that's an increase of 65. 65 is the bit of base value, the point of reference of 320, because 320 is what we're starting out with, and that's what we're looking for. As you can see, it's a nasty number, 60. And, but since, because they're looking for approximate, we can, this is the exact value, we're going to approximate it by assuming, by, by pretending rather, not assuming, or assuming, pretending, same thing, by assuming, or rather, by pretending, that uh, 65, oh, well, we're not going to pretend it is true, by approximating 65 as a 64. And now it's approximate. Why 64? Why not 66? Because 64 is the ninth multiple of 32. 32 goes into 64 exactly twice, and you have 0 here, so it's just 2 over 10, 2 over 10, which means the percentage increase in the profit was approximately 20. The profit went up by approximately 20%. Number 183. In 183, we are told that when integer x is divided by integer y, the remainder is 9. It's important to understand that they are both integers. Both of these quantities are whole numbers. And we are told that when one whole number x is divided by another whole number y, the remainder is 9. Like this. When x is divided by y, well, x divided by y, let's suppose that it goes n times. So n times y. When we subtract n times y from x, we have a remainder of 9. That's what we are told. We are further told that if x divided by y is in fact equal to 96.12, then how much is y? Well, let's find out, shall we? From here we can see, from here we can see that x is equal to, x is going to be equal to n times y plus the remainder. And this tells us that x must equal to also, let's keep the two separate here, let's put a demarcation, and this tells us that x must equal 96.12 times y, 96.12 times y. 96.12 can be written as 96 plus 0.12 times y, in other words, x is equal to 96y plus 0.12y. You see that? That tells us that our n here, how however many times it went complete cycle, this n here must equal 96. This n here is 96. But we are not interested in finding out n, we want to find out what y is. Well, y, y is right here. 1.12y point, point must equal 9. 0.12y must equal 9. I left no room for myself at all. Let's do it here. We don't need this thing. This is too elementary. It is too elementary. Would you agree, Watson? So, let's do that here. So, y, point 0.12y must equal 9. Point 0.12y must equal 9. Which means y must equal 9 over point 0.12. Multiply top and bottom by 100. Y multiply top and bottom by 100 so that we can get rid of this decimal. And when we do that, we find that Y is equal to 9 times 100. 9 times 100 over 12. I'm going to erase this thing because it's getting too crowded. There you go. Just simplify it. Divide top and bottom by 3. 9 becomes 3. 12 becomes 4. Divide top and bottom by 4, 4 goes away and 100 becomes 25, there you go. 
y must equal 3 times 25, y is 3 times 25 or 75. And that was number 183. Let's move on, shall we? Just give me one quick break here before we carry on. I always end up taking too long before I take my break and by that time the, the tea is ice cold or blasted. So we're done with this thing, okay? We are at number 184. 184 is a quite straightforward problem. Very simple problem. We are told that x times 2x plus 1 has to equal to 0. And we are told and x plus half times 2x minus 3 must also equal to 0. The question is, what is the value of x that satisfies both of this equation? Let's find out. Well, if x times this quantity is equal to 0, that means either x is equal to 0 or this quantity is equal to 0. 2x, 2x plus 1 is equal to 0, which implies that 2x must equal to negative 1, which implies x must be negative half. So x can take either one of these two values and this equation will be satisfied. Let's see what happens here. Here, if this quantity is 0, that implies that x, equal to, equal, x has to be negative half. Or, now at this point, you can stop if you wanted to. We don't have to continue. There is no need to continue. It doesn't matter what the or part is. Or part is not going to agree with, with, the, with, the, with, the, uh, with here, because here x is equal to 0. This is not going to yield 0. This is the only common value we have. But if you want to continue, the other possibility is that 2x minus 3 is equal to 0, which means x must be 3 halves. So if either of these two values are assumed by x, either 3 halves or negative half, in this, con in this equation will be satisfied. But the only value that satisfies both of these equations is when x is equal to half. Number 185. In number 185, we are given two pictures, a square and a rectangle. square in a rectangle. And we are told, this is the most important part, we are told that these triangles that we see, this square is made up of four triangles, this rectangle is made up of four triangles, and we are told that these triangles are identical. These are same exact pieces of cardboard. If you put one piece of cardboard on top of each other, they are identical. No difference at all, except we take the eight pieces of cardboard and we made a rectangle out of it. In this case, rather four pieces of cardboard and we made, we made a rectangle out of it by laying them down this way. In this case, we put them down this way and we made a square. Here's what we're looking for. We're looking for the ratio of the perimeter of square to the perimeter of the rectangle. Obviously the ratio is not one to one just because they are both made up of four identical uh, pieces of cardboard does not mean that their perimeter is going to be the same because they are laid out in different ways. Let's find out, shall we? Let's start with a simple part, simple part first here. Let's pretend that this side is equal to S. All the sides are going to be equal. But this, we'll, we'll come to that in a second. It's the, it's, the, it's the hypotenuse we have to worry about. If this is S, then from here to here is also S. This is also S right here. And this is from here to here is S. This is S and this is S. As you can see, the perimeter of rectangle is very straightforward. Perimeter of rectangle is simply 6S. That's the easiest one. Now what we need to understand here is that, that why don't we label this thing so, we can so that we can see it here. I'm going to deal with this, this particular uh, triangle. Let's call it A, B, and see if you stay with me here. A to B is your hypotenuse. This guy right here is the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse here shows up here. 
this is the hypotenuse. These two are equal. This this side is equal to this side, and that's your A to B, and this is your point C. Can you see it? You have to visualize them. It's sitting differently, but it's this triangle is the exact same thing as this triangle ACB, ACB. As you can see, A to B is the hypotenuse. A to B is the hypotenuse. This side A to C, A to C is S. This side B to C uh, is S. B to C is S. Somehow we have to figure out this side, the hypotenuse, which is very straightforward to figure out because it's, since this side is equal to this side, since this side is equal to this side, it's a 45 degree triangle. Obviously, this is 45, and this is 45. In a 45 degree triangle, we know that they are in the ratio of 1, 1, and root 2. In other words, if this is S and this is S, this is just root 2 times S. This side A to B is root 2 times S. And therefore, the perimeter of the square is going to be 4 times this amount because each side, this side is also root 2 times S, and this side is root 2 times S. You get the idea. It's 4 times root 2 times S. That's all. All we have to do is simplify this thing, and we are done. Divide top and bottom by S, S, is, S drops out. Divide top and bottom by 2, this becomes 2 and this becomes 3, and we end up with the fact that the ratio of the perimeter of square to the perimeter of rectangle is 2 times root 2, 2 times root 2, over 3. The ratio is not 1 to 1. Root 2, I'm, I'm, this part is not necessary for the exam, you understand? I'm just, root 2 is approximately 1.4. 2 times root 2, 2 times root 2 is going to be approximately 2.8 over 3. As you can see, the ratio is not 1 to 1. Anyway, that's the answer. 2 root 2 divided by 3. That was number 185. That was 185. That's the very last problem on the page. That seems to me like a logical place to stop. So therefore, we're going to stop right here. We're going to remember to do problem number 180 when we meet next time. In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, if you would like to work with me, if you would like to hire me to help you prepare for the exam, you can always get hold of me by sending me an email. Simply go to my website at kashwaniprep.com and from there you can send me an email or at my website you will also see a, also find a chance to fill out a form if you wish to tell me a little bit more about yourself. Alright, and then we'll talk more. Bye now.